and welcome to Lofty Pursuits and Public Displays of Confection in Tallahassee, Florida. This is Greg. Today, Jake is going to make some shamrock candy in the flavor of Irish coffee, a great tradition that doesn't go back as far as you might think. And we're going to talk about that today. And we'll make a real Irish coffee at the end of this video. It's a story about early aviation. It's a story about the transition of a flavor from one continent to another. And it's a story about being in the right place at the right time. Jake has cooked, flavored, and colored the hot sugar, and he's pouring it on our candy cooling table that's going to do a great job dropping the temperature. Watch as the video goes on, and you'll see the candy go from a liquid to a semi-solid to a solid. And that is, of course, how you want hard candy to be. The bits of the candy that were touching the table get quite cold, but the top stays liquid. We need it all to be the same temperature, so Jake folds it up and drips it and manipulates it to even the temperature out. He's trying to get the candy to be sort of the consistency of a clay, so it'll hold the shamrock impression. We're using a set of old Thomas Mill drop rollers to make this candy, and we have a set with shamrocks on it as the pattern. So of course this is part of our shamrock assortment, an 11 flavor assortment of Irish treats, from vanilla whiskey to oh chocolate stout, and of course we do hops this year, which was an experimental flavor that seems to be going over pretty well. But the trick is to capture a liquid in a solid. And Irish coffee is definitely a liquid, and we capture it in the solid of candy. It's the fall of 1943 when the story begins. World War II's going on, the German forces are being tied up as Stalingrad gets recaptured by the Russians, Germany's counter blockade of the Atlantic Ocean was failing or faltering, and this allowed commercial air travel to Europe to regain popularity. People were flying from North America to Ireland because Ireland had become the gateway to Europe, being the closest point to North America. And they were doing this on flying boats. A flying boat, if you're not familiar with it, is an airplane that lands on the water. And most commercial airliners that were doing transatlantic flights were this style of plane. It would allow them to land in an emergency anywhere in the ocean, but it would also allow them to land without a long runway, which hadn't been built in most places. And it was the war. You can't bomb the ocean and ruin the runway. If you were flying to Europe from the United States, there'd be multiple hops, and one of the hops would be to Ireland, to Foynes Airport. A flight left from Foynes, it was a Pan Am flight. You may have heard about the Pan Am Hotel at LaGuardia Airport in New York City and its glory, but this was Pan Am when it was the glory in the golden age of air travel. A flight left this airport heading to North America, but it didn't make it. It hit bad weather and had to turn back. And it was coming back late, it radioed ahead, and it let them know that they were coming in and they had cold passengers because they had a cold front and they should have something to warm them up. The restaurant had already closed, but they got in touch with the head bartender and the chef, Joe Sheridan, and he reopened the restaurant. Knowing these guys were coming in, he decided to make a special treat. The special treat was Irish coffee, and these passengers warmed themselves up. One asked, is this coffee Brazilian? And he said, no, this coffee is Irish. And the Irish coffee was born. But it might have died there if a few other things hadn't happened. And serendipity is a wonderful thing, whenever it happens. Jake is using the drop roller machine to press out sheets of candy. These candies will become individual shamrocks a little later. But right now, if you want to try this for yourself or the other 10 varieties in this assortment, our shamrock assortment is for sale at our website, www.pd.net. You can also come by the shop. We're in Tallahassee, Florida, and if you ever come by, we're right off I-10 on the Thomasville Road exit. We'd love to see you. He liked the drink and he kept it on the menu. And it was there until 1951 where Staten Delaplane flew in. He was a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle. And in 1951, he tried the drink. He thought it was great. And when he went back to San Francisco, he craved it again. And at the Buena Vista Cafe, he tried for an evening to replicate the flavor and the ingredients. It became so successful that Jack Coppler, the owner of the restaurant, became the most successful bar in San Francisco at the time, just because of the Irish coffee. A year later, he decided he wanted the original chef, so he hired Sheridan, and Sheridan immigrated to the United States and became the bartender at this restaurant. At the time, everyone who went to San Francisco had to have one. Here's Marilyn Monroe and her husband Arthur Miller enjoying one with Chef Sheridan serving it. 
it's very rare for a chef to come up with something or a bartender that becomes so ubiquitous you can get it almost anywhere. And Chef Sheridan did. And that's pretty amazing, all because of the luck of having a cold flight come in in 43 and the right reporter come in in 1951. So Jake picks up and drops the drops, and they break into the individual little shamrock pieces, and you no longer have to wonder why they call them drops. And a little while, we're going to blend them with the other ten flavors for the full assortment. The airport where this all took place still exists, and they still welcome visitors with Irish coffees, just like they did back in the 40s and the 50s. They're known for them worldwide, and that's where it started, and you can go back and enjoy it. It was, and still is, I guess, Ireland's first international airport. Now that our Irish coffee candy is done, it's time for us to make some actual Irish coffee. In making this video, I discovered I'd been making it wrong. I was just putting some whiskey in coffee. But there's more to it than that. You see, it's a dessert drink. It uses brown sugar, one tablespoon, whiskey, hot coffee, and whipped cream, but lightly whipped cream to a glass that's been warmed with boiling water already. I add the sugar, I add the whiskey, and then I add the hot coffee, about four ounces, and I stir it all to dissolve. Now here's the big difference. It uses lightly whipped cream. Now don't grab that can of Ready Whip or dissolve it into some liquid cream, I guess. But I've whipped this up just out of heavy cream with a little whip. It's not very hard to do. It takes a couple of moments and it makes a difference. Now you pour it over the back of the spoon to make a nice white layer of cream. And this is where I went wrong in this video. I'm not totally sure how you're supposed to defeat the brownie in motion. Maybe a different Greg who's out there who knows more about how to drink can help me. But I couldn't get an even layer. It's kind of blended in, but it tasted delicious. And that's what the brown sugar does. Some recipes call for sugar cubes, but I think the brown sugar does something special to this drink. The perseverance of Sheridan's drink is so much that that bar in San Francisco still sells 2,000 Irish coffees a day. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to us here on YouTube and click the bell. You can buy our Shamrock assortment on our website, www.pd.net. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can listen to our podcasts wherever podcasts are found. Thank you again for watching. We do appreciate it.